on our full schedule for today. Uh, and again, in the interest of brevity, I will introduce Congressman Gallagher with one word, Marine. <laughs> That's good. And nerd, nerdy Marine is very cool. Uh, thank you. This coin is amazing. I can't believe you guys put this together. That's cool. I will display that proudly in my office and cherish it for a long time to come. It's, uh, it's an honor to be with here, uh, with all of you here today. And what a great presentation that we just heard. I want to talk a little bit about um, service, citizenship, and starship troopers. What is the moral difference, if any, between the soldier and the civilian? The difference answers our hero, Johnny Rico, lies in the field of civic virtue. A soldier accepts personal responsibility for the safety of the body politic of which he is a member, defending it, if need be, with his life. The civilian does not. Retired mobile infantry Lieutenant Colonel Jean Dubois is not pleased. The exact words of the book, he replies. But do you understand it? Do you believe it? So goes the day's lesson in history and moral philosophy, a mandatory class for students of the Terran Federation, a world imagined by U.S. Naval Academy graduate Robert Heinlein in his 1959 novel, Starship Troopers. This conference forces all of us to think about the ways in which technology might disrupt future war. As attendees of this conference, I think you should spend some time thinking about how your interest in science fiction might disrupt your ability to find a date going forward. <laughs> uh, but I've chosen Highland's book because uh, it focuses on a human theme, the warrior's place in society. Because the truth is, as was mentioned before, no technology can transcend the nature of war or compensate for a waning warrior ethos. This is a book that shows how high-powered suits allow mobile infantrymen rapidly drop from naval spaceships via capsules into foreign planets to cover miles in minutes and for a PFC to carry and drop more firepower than an entire Air Force. Yet it is also a book that reminds us, as Heinlein's hero Johnny Rico puts it, that a man in a spacesuit can be just as stupid as anyone else. <laughs> and while weapons of war may be protean, as Rico's drill sergeant Zim reminds us in the end, there are no dangerous weapons. There are only dangerous men. And underlying the whole enterprise of dangerous men and women is a sacred trust, a covenant that binds warriors together based on a shared ethos, but also binds warriors to the society that we serve. It stands to reason that even in a society which manages, as I think we do, to send our very best to serve in the military, and the Naval Academy is the best example of that, the strength of that force ultimately depends on the underlying strength of the society that we serve. A healthy society will recruit strong men and women to keep that society safe, and it stands to reason that a sick society will eventually infect its armed forces with that weakness. As I lose my place due to technology. Uh, <laughs> so the Terran Federation imagined by Hyman in his novel arises out from the ashes of a world grown soft and given way to chaos in which wolf packs of children armed with chains, knives, homemade guns, bludgeons roam the street and murder, drug, addiction, larceny, assault, and vandalism become commonplace. Heinlein writes that a lack of moral responsibility was the soft spot which destroyed what was in many ways an admirable cultural. The junior hoodlums who roamed their streets were symptoms of a greater sickness. Their citizens, all of them counted as such, glorified their mythology of, quote, rights and lost track of their duties. As a result, the Terran Federation, established by veterans in the aftermath of a destructive war between a Russian-Anglo-American alliance on the one hand and the Chinese hegemony on the other, placed primacy on instilling a sense of duty through corporal punishment if necessary. Individuals are viewed like untrained puppies. They misbehave not out of malice, but out of their superior's neglect and a lack of discipline enforcement. The defining characteristic of the Federation is that only those who have served honorably can gain citizenship and exercise their franchise or the right to vote. It's not so much that the veterans who created the Terran Federation do not respect what we would call inalienable rights, it's that they view these rights as privileges that come not from God but from the sacrifices of those who have allowed their polity to enjoy them. As Lieutenant Colonel Dubois puts it, liberty is never unalienable. It must be redeemed regularly with the blood of patriots or it always vanishes. In an ironic twist, 
I think Starship Trooper is the story of a society grounded in service and discipline that despite its martial foundation operates almost entirely apart from its military, which exists as an aloof guardian class. Soldiers and civilians find it largely impossible to understand one another, and both seem to look down on each other simultaneously. As Johnny's dad says, we've outgrown wars. This so-called federal service is parasitism, pure and simple, a functionless organ, utterly obsolete, living on the taxpayers. A decidedly expensive way for inferior people who otherwise would be unemployed to live at the public expense for a term of years, then give themselves heirs for the rest of their lives. Jerry, I'm not saying you're living off the taxpayer, or putting on heirs, but that's right. <laughs> Now, in our own society, which was founded largely by veterans, 58% of the founders were veterans, you need not serve to vote, and civilians largely revere the military. Yet Highland's world throws our own challenges into sharp relief. While we don't yet have wolf packs of children terrorizing our streets, although some parents in the audience might disagree with that, um, America today is beset by a sort of sickness and collapse in civic virtue that would be familiar to Lieutenant Colonel Dubois' history and moral philosophy class. Physically, two out of three Americans today are overweight or obese compared with less than half in 1959 when the novel was published, costing taxpayers roughly $150 billion each year and growing. Life expectancy, while higher than it was in 1959, went down last year for the first time in two and a half decades. Americans are killing themselves with far greater frequency. Just last year, suicide rates reached a 30-year high, surpassing 1950s levels. Economically, as Nicholas Eberstadt has chronicled, America is now home to an immense army of jobless men no longer even looking for work, more than 7 million alone between the ages of 25 and 55, the traditional prime of working life. In other words, we have an army of men who have chosen not to be men, living off girlfriends or the government, dull, while spending their days playing video games, drinking, or doing drugs. Politically, trust in government is at a historic low. Congress, I think, has a 12% approval rating. That's lower than cockroaches and colonoscopies at the current rate. You can check me on that. Um, they actually pulled colonoscopies. <laughs> and Genghis Khan and Britney Spears. Um, less than 30% of 12th graders are proficient in civics. Only one in three Americans could pass a citizenship test. And our reflexive thank you for your service culture covers up a civil military divide that, as a recent book on the topic concluded, contributes to strategic incoherence, permits the imposition of social policies that erodes battlefield lethality, fosters a sense of victimization towards veterans that skews defense spending towards pay and benefits, and distances veterans from our broader community. So what do we do? What do we as warrior nerds do when confronted with a growing decline in civic duty and personal responsibility? Some have argued for a renaissance in civic education in our grade schools and high schools, perhaps to take a page from Starship Troopers' mandatory courses taught by veterans on history and moral philosophy. Well, I'm all for some version of this. Since the earliest days of Western civilization, the purpose of education has been to form good, democratic, small-d citizens. That's why after World War II, it was a good investment for the Republic to pay for the kid from Green Bay who had fought at Guadalcanal to go to Madison on the GI Bill and study Plato and Shakespeare. But I suspect even if we were able to spark that renaissance, this would be inadequate. Others have argued that we need a national service requirement. If only everyone, this is sort of a reverse of Starship Troopers in a way, if only everyone were forced to serve, then we would all have a sense of the stakes and our divided society would find a way to come together. This sounds very nice. It is intuitively appealing. But I would argue it would cost a lot of money at a time when we cannot fully resource the military we currently have. Furthermore, as Heinlein argues in this book, it isn't easy to, quote, instill moral virtue, socially responsibility, into a person who doesn't have it, doesn't want it, and resents having the burden thrust on him. If he has it forced down him, he will vomit it out. At best, I believe a national service requirement might give us a slightly better society, but it would come at the cost of a less professional, less lethal, and less ready military. So if expanded civics education and universal national service won't cut it, what will? There is, of course, Heinlein's vision. It may seem tempting. It may seem more orderly. And um, indeed, there are parts of it that every year or so when I read it, I find appealing. But 
As with any oligopoly or dictatorship, it is ultimately a dystopia, a world in which our rights are not inalienable, but rather benevolently just bestowed on us by the guardian class subverts the very idea of America. And unlike in Starship Troopers, where veterans lead civilization out of chaos at the cost of a broadly participatory society, I think there's another path forward, one that may be more difficult, but is ultimately nobler and more in line with our values as Americans. As Secretary Mattis recently said in an impromptu speech to deployed servicemen and women that I'm sure you all saw, he said, you're a great example for our country right now, and it's got problems. You know it, and I know it. It's got problems we don't have in the military. And you just hold the line, my fine soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines. You just hold the line until our country gets back to understanding and respecting each other and showing it, of being friendly to one another, that Americans owe one another. We're so doggone lucky to be Americans. We've got two powers, the power of inspiration, and we'll get that power back, and we've got the power of intimidation, and that's you. If someone wants to screw with our families, our country, and our allies. So how do we, how do we, how do you midshipmen in particular hold the line? To start with, we need to look inward as veterans and acknowledge that contrary to what Secretary Mattis said, we do have problems. Our ranks are not immune from the many challenges that plague our society. Depression, addiction, obesity, sexual assault, suicide. This is obviously eroding our power of intimidation, compromising our warfighting excellence. And it should come as no surprise. After all, we are not, as Lieutenant Colonel Dubois views the mobile infantry in Starship Troopers, a guardian class, better than the rest of society, somehow immune to its ills. Rather, we are a component part of society, one showing symptoms of a broader social disease. As the classic manual for the armed forces officer tells us, to think of the military as a guardian class apart, rather than a strong right arm, corporately joined to the body and sharing its every function is historically false and politically inaccurate. As retired Army Colonel Bob Killebrew put it recently, paraphrasing an old Marine he knew decades ago, remember that the longer you stay in uniform, the less you will really understand about the country you protect. Democracy is the antithesis of military life. It's chaotic, dishonest disorganized, and at the same time glorious, exhilarating, and free, which you are not. After a while, if you stay in, you'll be tempted to say, look, you civilians, we've got a better way. We're better organized. We're patriotic. And we know what it is to sacrifice. Be like us, and you'll be dead wrong, son. Your duty as a service member is, first and foremost, to be that strong right arm of the republic withstanding and doling out violence well as dangerous men and women when necessary in order to keep the country safe. To the extent that technology, however, serves as a crutch or science perpetuates the fiction that warfighting is no longer fundamentally about human will and discipline, it's dangerous and distracts from our duty. But holding that line also demands that you avoid disdain for your fellow citizens because your responsibilities as a warrior go beyond the battlefield. We cannot and must not force the rest of society to join our ranks as military men and women or adopt our military worldview or simply put us in charge as is shown in this vision. Rather, I think we must reverse the arrow, so to speak, by finding a way to redeploy into the ranks of society. In other words, holding the line means not only exercising that power of intimidation, but also wielding the weapon of inspiration because the military still stands for virtues that are no longer in fashion. Respect for human dignity, humility, discipline, self-sacrifice, virtues that I believe must be reawakened. And through, and I'm talking to the midshipmen here primarily, through your example, you can remind the body politic not that we're somehow better than them or the best among them, but of what is best within all of us. We can't impose a martial spirit on society, but we can serve as an example. Because your moment of crisis may not come in Kabul, it may come back home in your community. And amidst a society plagued by constant scandal and endless outrage, 
simply by keeping your cool, keeping your honor clean, and dealing with everyday crises in disciplined ways, you can serve your country. In other words, if you fancy yourself a modern-day Cincinnatus, remember the defining trait of Cincinnatus is not just that he left the plow to serve his country in his time of need, but that he, as George Washington did so many years later, resisted the temptations of power and returned to the farm. His strength was in self-restraint. And it's that example that our society so desperately needs today. Our nation today is unrestrained in so many ways. We're bankrupting our children with unrestrained spending. We're degrading our discourse with unrestrained and tribally based political rhetoric. We are polluting our minds and our bodies with unrestrained pleasures. Our society is in crisis. The military is training and has trained many of you how to act in moments of crisis. And your duty does not end when you take off the uniform. So I'm sorry to the midshipmen, but you've not just signed up for like five years, you've signed up for a lifetime of service, no matter how you might try to get out of it. Because unlike in Starship Troopers, your service will confer on you no additional rights. Your vote will count the same as the person in your high school class who spent the last four years playing video games. That may seem unfair. I'm sorry to all the video game players in the audience. Uh, <laughs> but in a fair world, we would not need a military. You are here because the world is unfair. Civilians will thank you for your service, but their words will sound hollow next to the sacrifices we're gonna ask you to make. The benefits you receive will be few and the responsibilities you take on many. However, my hope for all of you is that what you, will, you will acquire something far more important. The knowledge that when the moment of crisis came, you held the line. Thank you. I really appreciate it and happy to answer any questions. Now we play Stump the Chump. Yes, sir. You're up. What difficulties did you face when you left the Marine Corps? Specifically, what surprised you that was difficult? That's a great question. So, um, can I, like, no, I won't run. Um, so first of all, unless it's changed in the intervening uh, seven year or 10 years, um, the transition program to get out of the Marine Corps, I think, is an abysmal failure. Uh, TAPS did not prepare anyone who was in that class for the civilian world. The capstone of the process was somehow teaching people that a suit looked better if you wear a pocket square. And everyone was like amazed. People put pocket squares. I was like, oh my gosh. Um, so I, I think we are failing right now to prepare people for that transition. But I do think um, what is surprising on the positive side is just how much goodwill there is right now in all of our communities for veterans. If you're a veteran and you need a job, a civilian job, and you just can show up to work every single day, I have thousands of jobs for you in Northeast Wisconsin. And I guarantee you whatever you're paying for housing in Annapolis is like eight times more expensive <laughs> than Green Bay, Wisconsin. So we have any number of organizations that have sprouted up, all of our manufacturers want to hire veterans, it's all there, but we haven't found a way to get that transition period from active duty back into civilian life um, right. And I think a lot of people are falling through the cracks right now. And as a result, we do still have this sort of paradox where everyone is just reflexively supportive of the military. We fly flags in our lawns, we say thank you for your service, we're bending over our backwards to help vets but I don't think we've actually bridged that civil-military divide in any real or meaningful way. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question at all, but yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned a couple of times suicide. Yeah. And that our society is killing, we're killing ourselves at a higher rate than we have in the past. And I would think that part of that is that our soldiers are, are coming back to our nation that is in a state of dystopia and there is a very dramatic disconnect there. Do you think that the uh, services from start to finish, meaning the day that you go through INDOC mm. to the day that you are exited of the military, do you think that, they, that there is a way to show our soldiers, uh, sailors and airmen, that, that there is the purpose beyond the military um, that while at the same time does not encroach on that a very important divide between military and civil service. Yeah, I, I do, or I have to believe there's a way to get at this crisis. And I will say we're making some progress. We do a, a big ruck march uh, every year uh, with this great organization called Fourth Hua 
um, where, you know, uh, last year we marched 22 miles because of 22 veterans taking their lives every day. This year we marched 20 because the average is going down. I think until we get that number closer to zero, we can't rest. Um, but I got to believe there's a way we can, we can get at this. Um, I've thought, worked a lot with the VA on um, resources for mental health and uh, figuring out a way where we can bring the nonprofit uh, sector and the private sector into this process. I will tell you, though, there is a lot of reticence and resistance from the veteran service organizations whenever you talk about reforming the VA, uh, particularly among those from, let's say, the Vietnam uh, era. Uh, any sort of change is viewed as an attempt to take away VA benefits or to privatize the VA. When we're just looking for a creative and flexible model to be able to leverage things like telemedicine to get vets uh, the help they need. The other th challenge we have in this space is that we have all these great organizations that are, they're, they're still there, but they're kind of on life support, right? Like your local VFW, your American Legion, uh, all these things that they're still, they're, they still exist. It's amazing what they do for the community, but I think for my generation, for the 9-11 generation, uh, it's harder to convince people to get involved in those. And I do believe that the best way for veterans to make that transition back to civilian life is to have a veteran who can guide them in that process and get plugged into the veterans community because oftentimes you're reticent to speak to anyone who's not part of that community. So I just started a program, small thing, in my district where we're actually going to get data on who is coming back to Northeast Wisconsin from active duty and assign them a mentor if they want to participate in the program and get them plugged into that network and just make them aware of everything that's going on. We're calling it the Northeast Wisconsin Veterans Battalion, new, new Veterans Battalion. And so I think that model, hopefully we'll see, I mean, it's going to be the first that we try might work, but I just got to believe there's a better way to get at that than what we're doing I, now. Yeah, I, I don't think we're going to bring society to us. Yeah. I think we're going to have to, as, as families, as service members, their families, we're raising our children in a way that they understand the, the sacrifice of service, but we're also sitting there watching our kids in school with, with a whole student body that is totally disconnected from, from that yeah. aspect of service, and I'm just wondering if from beginning to end, yeah. if, if, I know Cincinnatus is such a big figure, that this idea that you finished your time and now you can go yeah. and be quiet. But I think our service members, they went because they're not quiet. They went because they want to be in effect. And if we change the ideas of Cincinnatus, or if we try to rise another theory that also says that your work is not done yet, yeah. and there is a place for you, and regardless of your dysfunction, the sacrifice that you've made, or, or any, any injuries, or <laughs> any of the things that you are coming out of the military to help you survive, there still is a purpose for you out there. Yeah. I just say two things. Uh, one, a colleague of mine, Brian Mast, great guy, lost both his legs in Afghanistan, is now serving in Congress, uh, has this idea for sort of like an exit oath of office geared towards that, which is an intriguing concept. Um, and then uh, I forgot what the second point I was going to say was, but it was going to be brilliant and it will come back to me in a moment. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, back there. Yes, sir. Uh, you touched briefly on sort yeah. of bridging the gap between the civilian and the veteran community yeah. as far as communication. And you know, sometimes it feels like we're speaking different languages, we're parts of entirely different cultures. And you know, the glimpses that civilians get into it uh, through popular media, movies, video games, and stuff, sometimes they're not yeah. the best examples. Like, I, you know, I've on more than one occasion heard, so is it just like all duty? Yeah. <laughs> And you're like, it's totally exactly like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but way more badass. Yeah. And movies like The Hurt Locker, which are great character pieces, yeah. give people false perceptions on what actually being in a deployment, being in a combat zone is like. So uh, what would you say would be some ways to sort of alleviate that and correct that and oh. use media to, bring, to bridge the gap back between these two sort of separate cultures we have within our society? Man, that is a great that is a great question, and I don't have a, an easy answer for it. I, I would say, uh, so let me see if I can tie it to my current experience. So I, I, I get a lot of uh, people now that I'm I'm in in Congress asking me, you know, I, I want to get involved in politics and I want to do this and that. And first I'm like, go have your head examined if you want to do that. But uh, <laughs> but I do think it's a positive thing. I think as um, as the 9-11 generation steps up to serve, not only in political office, but I'll just use that as an example, I think that's gonna do a lot to correct perceptions of 
what the military is and what is it isn't. Because I think you're totally right. I, I confront a lot of civilians back home who, one, think I have, what's the famous, uh, uh, Kennedy had a great quote after the Bay of Pigs where he said, you know, if someone comes up to me talking about the minimum wage or this or that, I have no problem overriding because I know it. But we just assume that the military has some rare knowledge not available to ordinary mortals. And so people think, and you, so on the one hand, people are like, wow, you're, you were in the military. You must know, like, everything about the world. But also I think sort of on the other side, there's a sense that veterans, because of sort of the Hurt Locker stuff, are also very fragile at the same time. And there's, we don't want to engage in that all of us have, have PTSD, right? And then the, the littlest thing could trigger that. So I think those of us in public office can do a lot to talk honestly about service to correct that perception. But we also got to be really careful because, listen, you know, I, I only, I've only run for office once, but like you, in the context of a 30-second cheesy political ad, your identity gets reduced to one thing. And you hit it. It's Marine, right? Like... Mike, the Marine, like I have people come up to me like, uh, did you serve in the Marine Corps? We didn't know or not. Like, and then you pay thousands of dollars for polls and it comes back saying, hey, people like that you served in the military. Wow, no crap. I didn't know that. Thanks. <laughs> um, but uh, so I, I do think we got to be careful about wrapping ourselves in the flag too much. And because the, the flip side of the all-volunteer force, which I do think is a remarkable achievement and a luxury, and if we can defend the country – for less than anywhere between three to four percent of our GDP and avoid conscription, that's one of the best deals in human history right there. Um, but the paradox is that, and, and the, the flip side of the fact that everyone reveres the military is I think every solution internationally now, every problem has a military solution, right? And so we've elevated the military to be in charge of everything, right? At the expense of diplomacy, I think we've almost completely lost our ability to conduct information warfare, psychological operations in the way that Eisenhower was able to do in the 50s with the Psychology Strategy Board under C.D. Jackson. Um, so there is a downside to the reverence of the military and the, the just the, the sense that the military, military can do everything. And I think it, that's where guys like me come in who have served, and I didn't do much, but now find ourselves in public office. We have to be honest about it. Because above all, you know, what I learned in the military in many ways, beyond sort of what I talked about duty and sacrifice, is when you're at the tip of the spear, man, things get messy pretty quickly. So things that seem neat and tidy when designed in a congressional office in D.C. quickly get complex downrange. And so that gives me a little bit of humility now when I try and vote on things and understand problems. Sir? Can I ask you a policy question, sir? Sure. Budget Control Act. How much longer are <laughs> we living under? To quote uh, the gentleman earlier, bad, very bad. Uh, uh, okay, so I, uh, this audience, I suspect, you know, knows what the BCA is and how to quote Secretary Mattis. It's done more damage to our military than any enemy in the field. It was never the sequester was never supposed to get into effect. This was the sort of Damocles that was going to hang over legislators and force them to confront. Um, are out of control entitlement spending. They never came to a compromise, and the military was punished in the pro process. And I think we've cut uh, upwards of a trillion dollars relative to the Gates baseline budget. Um, and we're seeing it right now. I mean, I'm not saying that you can draw a direct arrow from that to the Fitzgerald and the McCain, but certainly I believe there's a correlation. And Jerry, well, I, by that I say there was also real leadership, yeah. human failures at the same the time. Reports yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I think there is a direct line in the line. Yeah. Those and we're forcing the Navy to do more with less, and it's not like the oceans have gotten any smaller or the world's gotten any safer. I think we've cut real terms 22%. I say the world hasn't gotten 22% safer since 2010, and China's tripling down on their investments. So uh, I wish we'd just get rid of the caps and go back to regular order. Um, I don't see that happening. What I see happening in the early, uh, early 2018 is some sort of BCA cap-busting deal. So... The Democrats agree to um, defense spending, which I would argue the minimum needs to be what we just passed in the NDAA, so $630 billion roughly baseline, $700 billion total. Um, and it'll be a two-year deal. Uh, and then we agree to swallow increased non-defense uh, discretionary spending. Uh, I believe leadership in the House is trying to work out that deal, uh, but they're going to try and put everything into that omnibus bill, like a deal on DACA, a deal on everything. So that's going to be a messy messy vote and you can pick anything in there and use that as a reason to justify a no vote but for me it'll be all about the military if it funds the military at the right level uh, I'll be willing to accept a lot but I don't know if we're going to get there so if we don't 
Um, and I think we missed an opportunity at the beginning of this administration. In my sort of on Earth 2 somewhere, Donald Trump is giving an inauguration speech where he says, right after I'm done, I'm going to force every member of the House and Senate to go into session and get rid of the BCA. I'm asking you to do it right now because it's killing us. That didn't happen. So I suspect if we don't get the two-year cap deal, we'll just be waiting out the expiration of the BCA, which is uh, was 2022. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, and that's a bad place to be. Think how much we're losing. I mean, just not only in terms of readiness, but you know, modernization. I mean, I just shudder to think what the world's going to look like in 2022 if we allow that to happen. And I would consider it a dereliction of duty from Congress. So. Anybody else? Are we done? Out of time. Thank you guys so much. This is awesome. <laughs>